blessing. So take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 22. What we're going to do is we're going to follow through with uh, the text, the passages, the, uh, the process, the progress of Jesus going to the cross and going to heaven on his way to the ascension, uh, re- death, resurrection, ascension, and uh, the, the kind of the finishing out the book of Luke here as we head into the Easter season. Um, and so this has been uh, quite a ride, quite a journey of walking through the book of Luke, and it's been a real blessing for me to uh, listen to Pastor Dave, to work with Pastor Dave, to pray with him, and to talk with him, and to be able to share some of the messages with you all. So, and I... I echo Jane's prayers for his family and others who are traveling uh, this uh, this weekend. And you guys, as you travel back home, yeah, got to beat the snow. But yeah, is it snowing in Esterville yet? So it might be up there. You never know. That you guys have have a lot. So, but um, so let's dig in to Luke chapter twenty-two. Follow along with me from verse sixty-three. All right, verse 63. You all have outlines on your seats, on those, on those cards, so you can take a peek at those if you want. All right. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together both chief priests and scribes. And they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe, and if I ask you, will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God, so that all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it from his own lips. Chapter 23. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is a king. He himself is Christ, the king. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was from a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. And he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priest and the scribe stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him with the splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before they had been at enmity with each other. When we look at this courtroom scene, the trials of Jesus, we see more darkness. Darkness in our hearts. Remember the dark denial of Peter we talked about last week? In this passage right before here, Peter denies Jesus three times. Pastor Dave said, it's dark. It's dark. And darkness was inside. And we talked about our denials of the lord darkness does not dissipate because the rooster crows and the sun comes up when there's darkness in our hearts it's still there but what happens is the light dawns only to expose the deep deep darkness 
in our hearts. First, the religious council. Their thoughts and intentions are brought to light. They wanted to get rid of, of Jesus and keep their po positions of prominence. So they blasphemed him. They blasphemed the Son of God. Meaning, they took him down from his rightful prominence and put themselves up. Second, Pilate's most innermost intentions of codependence <laughs> were exposed. He saw Jesus as harmless. And he just wanted everyone to be happy. And he tried to slide out of making this decision about Jesus to keep the peace. But in so doing, what does he do? He pleased the people for a moment. But now is suffering for an eternity. Just like the religious council, just like Herod, and just like everyone today who looks at Jesus as harmless, who reject him. People who are looking for codependent support from the source are not depending upon Christ for their salvation. Third, there's Herod. His heart is selfish and insecure and it's displayed for all of us to see. He wanted to control Jesus. And he wanted Jesus' miracles for his own benefit. So there he is for the whole world to see. So now, if a person today faces all that Jesus said and all that Jesus did and continues to put him down and lift themselves up, they are following man-made ways. Blaspheming the Son of God. Likewise, if a person tries to ignore Jesus like Pilate, they, we need to confess our sins of codependent peacekeeping. Stop following this. Uh, apathy towards who Jesus is and idolatry of pleasing people. Similarly, if any of us selfishly want Jesus for what he can do for us, we must repent of mocking him. We must repent of being like Herod. So, in this passage, who's really on trial in the courtrooms? <laughs> is Jesus are on trial or is interrogators on trial? <laughs> right? And Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing this for who? For us today. It's for us today, and as we read this passage, who's on trial? Whose hearts are being, who the light is shining, God's shining a light into? It's our hearts. Obviously, the living word is going deep into our hearts. Will we receive it? Will we allow it to show there what's there? Will we be examined? We're on trial. We're the ones that Jesus is, is exposing for us right here and right now today. We need to examine ourselves day by day and moment by moment. Are we coming to Jesus on our terms or on his terms? Here's an example for us. See the title? Our true intentions, the, or, or another way I put it is, Jesus clashes with culture in order to expose our true intentions, right? Here's an example. About 30 years ago, it really hit the fan where uh, scholars and a lot of writers stopped, wanted to stop using B.C. and A.D. in reference to the time, right? So now what is it? Com uh, B.C.E., before the common era, and CE, the common era. So here's what Google has to say about that. You ready? <laughs> you know, the use of CE instead of AD in scholarship was historically motivated by the desire to avoid the implicit our Lord. Remember, AD, Anumai Domini, Anumai Domini right? In the year of our Lord, although other aspects of dating systems are based on Christian origin, A.D. is a direct reference to Jesus as Lord. 
Many people do not want to consider this reference, much less give a worldwide validation to Jesus. So what happens to you when there's a culture clash? You remember this one? You don't remember it. Well, maybe, yeah, because uh, you just read books and they all say CE, they all say BCE, right? Nobody, very few now say AD and BC. But you remember, some of you guys are old enough. Okay, so what do I do with this? How does this work? What happens to me? And, you know, there's a lot of other culture clashes these days. Huh? Can I get an Amen. Yeah, and so what do we do? How does this work in our lives? You got it. There's a light being shined into our hearts how God wants to deal with us in these culture clashes. He's dealing with, yeah, all that stuff. But more importantly, he's dealing with me. What is God up to? The truth is God uses cultural clashes For many reasons, but in this passage in the book of Luke, first and foremost, he wants to sanctify Christians. He wants to make us more like Jesus. He wants to help us to grow. He wants to work in our lives and we be like Christ. It's for our benefit that comes from the exposure of our hearts and our spiritual growth. That's what he does for Christians. So let's open ourselves up to that. Let's receive that. Let's look at what he wants to do in our lives. Pray with me about that. Father in heaven, here we are. We've got 10 or 12 cultural clashes we're thinking about right now in our minds. How are we going to do it? What is it for? What's it mean? How are we supposed to deal with this? And Lord, you want to work in our lives I pray that you would help us to look deep and to see what you see. Lord, there are intentions deep inside of me about, I, will, I just want prominence. There's a deep-seated intention inside of me to, be, uh, to keep the peace, to people please, to make everybody happy. There's a deep sense inside of me, inside of all of us, to control the situation, Lord. Expose that and work in us transform us may we be christians who are changed so that no matter what the culture issue is you are our lord we are dependent upon you only and we trust in you and we give you complete control so bless our us today we pray in jesus name amen so in verses 63 through 71 we see our intentions of prominence Here Jesus is before, what's it say? The council. After he'd been beaten, 63 through 65. After he, he, here he is bloody. This, this, This past is sort of dripping with irony, isn't it? So... You're the king of the Jews, and they've already beaten him. He's, he's just, he doesn't look like any kind of king. And, and think about this. Let me, let me first say this. Two ways that we try to retain our prominence. First of all, reversed reasoning. Reversed reasoning. If, if Jesus is the king, the son of God, they should be listening to him, not demanding from him. See what's going on? I'm coming to Jesus and I'm saying, or they're coming to Jesus and saying, you fix this. You prove it. You do what we tell you to do in order for us to believe. Who's in charge here? Uh, he, he says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the son of man. I'm the son of God. And we're, we're reversed reasoning. Jesus comes along and he, and he says, I'm the son of man. Now, this is a very important text of Scripture. Why? Because it's about the 40th time in the book of Luke that Jesus has said, I'm the Son of Man. He's referred to himself more in the New Testament as the Son of Man than anything else. And it causes us to go, wait, time out, what does that mean? So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, there is a Son of Man who has 
prominence, who has authority, who has the rights to come into what's referred to as the ancient of days, the king. This is God ruling in all of authority. And the Son of Man comes into there. He is the one who has the right, the authority, to sit beside Him on the right hand. He is given all the rulership, all the divine ever, everything, everywhere. And that's what Jesus calls Himself. And so when these Jewish council and these Jewish people hear the word Son of Man, they are shocked. And so what are they trying to do? Reverse it. They were trying to reverse it. Look at verse 68 or 69. Jesus says three things about the Son of Man. He says, I'm going to be seated at the right hand. Well, first of all, he says, I'm coming again from now on. I'm coming again. Second, I'm seated at the right hand. That's the place of authority. Third, I'm going to be the one to judge you. You're, you think you're judging me right now? You're, you're, you're reverse thinking, right? You think you're judging me? Look at what's going to happen. I'm going to come to judge you. Had Jesus said, I'm the Messiah, that would have been a great thing. But it might have fallen into what a mistake Every people say well you know a lot of people say they're ma the messiah a lot of people were in fact in those times saying hey i'm the messiah listen to me hey hey listen to me i'm the messiah i'm the one you should follow but when jesus says son of man there is no doubt it calls people to a higher allegiance it calls people, as they remember Daniel chapter 7, as they remember the prophecies, they have to think, wait a second, there is something he's saying about himself. One, one commentator says this, a claim to be the Messiah could be a mistake, but the Son of Man is linked to deity, not by accident, but by blasphemy. So if somebody, if one of us said we're the Son of Man, that's blasphemy. But when Jesus says, I'm the Son of Man, He is worshiping, He is honoring, He is speaking the truth. This reverse thinking is brought out more when Jesus said, when He answered, you say that I am. So what they did is they connected the Son of Man to the Son of God, rightly so, right? And Jesus said, you say that I'm the Son of God. He never denies He's the Son of God. He dies for being the Son of God. They blaspheme Him. Blaspheme him. So first way we try to retain our prominence is we reverse thinking. Instead of depending upon Jesus, listening to what he says, we come to him telling him what he's supposed to do. Second, we, we have inactive listening. You've heard of active listening, right? That's where you participate with people and you engage with what they're saying. That They're doing exactly the opposite. They haven't heard anything. Prophesy! Tell me who hit you! Right? They're, they're, they're inactive. Look at verse 67. Jesus said, if I tell you, you won't believe. For three years he said, I'm the son of man. And nobody's paid him any attention. Nobody's cared about anything. Now all of a sudden, oh, you're the Son of God. Book of verse 69. All of the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7 are coming to life right in front of these Jewish leaders, right in front of this assembly, right in front of this council. So my question is, why doesn't Jesus just put them in their place? Maybe it's the same reason He doesn't put people in their place when there's a cultural clash today. Tim Keller says it this way, Jesus always goes for conviction and conversation rather than condemnation and coercion. Jesus always goes for conviction and conversion rather than condemnation and coercion. So if I'm con condemning, if I'm coercing, I'm looking for what? Prominence. I'm looking for one-upmanship. But if I'm entering into a conversation, I'm putting Jesus in prominence. I'm letting the conversation happen. I'm letting Jesus work into people's lives no matter what the cultural clash is. 
The religious council were pursuing their prominence because if Jesus is exalted, they are brought down. Exactly the opposite of what John the Baptist said. He must increase, I must... Amen. They do not care if Jesus is right or wrong. They just care about their position. When we don't listen carefully to what Jesus says, we are pursuing our prominence. We're pursuing our upmanship. We are blaspheming Jesus. When we blaspheme, we can do what the council should have done. Repent and believe. So when this cultural clash hits you, when it hits all of us, when we are face to face with it, whatever it is, new one next week, right? It's all going to be all over Twitter. Day after that, week after that, there's going to be another one. And what are we going to do? Examine our hearts. Put Jesus in worship and let Him have authority and do His work. kind of happened to me this week. I, every year it happens about this time. I go to the district conference of a bunch of pastors here in Des Moines. Uh, Pastor Dave was there. And there we, here it's the same thing every year. We're standing around. We're in the atrium. We're talking to pastors. How many people go to your church? How many people are watching you on Zoom? How many people are, are checking out your Facebook? You know, how many people are, it's prominence. You see my heart? God is working to use all of this stuff. I came home, I started working on my sermon. I'm like, okay, let's start with prayer, Lord. Again, again, my heart is exposed. Your heart's exposed. Now, while we're at it, what cultural issue is vexing you today? <laughs> you got one, right? No? Yes, you do. You have a culture issue vexing you today. What position of prominence do you stand to lose if your idea is not winning the day? What reversed reason and inactive listening is Jesus calling you to repent of? To put Him in prominence. Take a minute. Go deep with the Lord for a second here. Prominence. We all want it. We all want to be above others, right? Are you ready? Let him increase and us decrease. Let your ideas get canceled. Let your ideas fail. Let your considerations lose the day. For what? For Jesus to be honored and to be lifted up. Two more ideas, but they're much shorter, okay? <laughs> they're much shorter. So in verses t uh, 1 through 5 of the next chapter, we, do, we try two things to keep the peace. But before we do that, look at verses 1 through 12. Now, now the Jews needed some other help to get Jesus canceled. I mean, Jesus killed. But Pilate does not help here. He just tries to keep the peace. Look at verse 1. There's the whole company. You have to refer back to verse 66. Who is this whole company? Yeah, this assembly, elders, people together, chief priests and scribes, formerly people who didn't agree with each other on doctrine or theology or all kinds of stuff. Specifically, the, the Pharisees said there is a resurrection. The Sadducees said there is no resurrection. If you ever want to try to keep that um, in your mind, uh, remember this. The, the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. That's why they're sad. You see, you've heard this? Okay, that's old. Okay, gotcha. Verse 2, three parts. There are three parts to this accusation. First, he's forbidding us. He's misleading our nation. He's forbidding us to pay taxes. Third, what's it say here? He's a king. So the first part, Pilate completely ignores. Whatever. He's misleading your country. I don't care. Second, he, he kind of ignores that. Like, seriously, this guy here with blood all over him, he's trying to get people. In fact, it was a bold-faced lie. Remember? What did Jesus do with the coin? Give to Caesar what's Caesar's 
and to God what's God's, right? He didn't forbid that. It's a bold-faced lie. But Pilate does, in verse 3, address the one thing. What's that? The king. Are you a king? And what does Jesus say? You have said so. Pilate declares Jesus not guilty, innocent. And the, the stakes go up. Look at verse 5. It's urgent now for these guys. Their back is against the wall. Their prominence is, is in jeopardy. They're ready to go down. So they upgraded the, the accusation. They take it up a notch. See? In verse 5. He is doing all this stuff from Galilee everywhere. It's messing everybody up. What's Jesus trying to do in this culture class? So we try to keep peace. We don't seek to know or understand what Jesus is means when he says i'm the king we just try to make everybody happy what's it mean we depend upon him one day there was a pastor who was preaching and uh um so so wait the first reason is is that we don't seek to know and we don't seek to care what jesus means when he says i'm the king that's what our devotion should be about. When we open the Word, that's what, it, that's what our prayer time should be. Lord, what does it mean in my life? So a pastor was preaching and he said, Hey, everybody, the problem with the church today is, is apathy and ignorance. Right? Apathy and ignorance. He goes on and on for about 10 minutes and there's a guy in the back, obviously on his phone, obviously fidgeting around, obviously not paying attention. He gets up, he goes out, he comes back in, and finally the pastor says, Hey, Mr. Johnson, what have I been talking about for the last ten minutes? And he said, Pastor, I don't know, and I don't care. Right? So apathy and ignorance is something that just continues, and we need to look to Jesus to see what does he say what does he actually mean Pilate could have said wait a second you say you're a king you don't look like a king what does it mean we all kind of look like this picture here of Jesus this is Jesus have you seen this picture before poor Jesus He's outside the door. He can't get in. So he's knocking. He's harmless. Just let him in. You know, I, you know just, just, just let him in. Just, just invite him in. He'll be, he, he's nice. Poor Jesus. Right? This is Pilate's approach. This is sometimes our approach. You get to choose to let him in. Poor, poor Jesus. We don't listen to him. We ignore him. We think he's harmless. Yes, he's knocking. But Revelation chapter 3 says he's knocking not at the door of a lost person, but he's knocking at the door of a church because he's kept outside. He has a sword coming out of his mouth. He's riding a horse and he's got a sash on him and he's coming to destroy. We don't know and we don't care. We pass the buck. Isn't that what Pilate was trying to do? Pass the buck. We ignore Jesus. We, we think somebody else can do it. We want to try to remain neutral. Here, here's a side note. You know, see that verse in verse 12? Herod and Pilate become friends. We, it's very interesting. Very few scholars, you, you read 12 commentaries, no, nobody really talks about that. Like, I don't know what it means. Most of us look at it and say, I don't have a clue what it means. I actually don't either, okay? But what we do know is that there's hundreds of historical books that you can go to your library and find in it uh, documents the fact that in A.D. 33, I said A.D. on purpose, right? In A.D. 33, Pilate and Herod became friends. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of common knowledge to everyone, and so Luke makes sure he puts it down. He document, he, he collects it. This is a historical fact at a particular time. We can't ignore Jesus. We must seek him. 
as the true king. Do you see it? Jesus bought the perfect peace between God and man. Pilate was trying to keep peace between the people. He gave, he, he kept that for a little bit. He tried to please the people. And so what did he do? Jesus was killed. And our eternal peace with God the Father was kept so that we can have peace with God and man through faith and trust in Jesus Christ who comes to our hearts, who we don't put away, we don't pass the buck, and we don't look at it as just harmless. Now look at Pilate for just a moment. In verses 23... Chapter 23, 6 through 12, we see the ways that we try to control. Look at what Herod does in verse 8. Herod was glad because he'd been wanting to see a miracle. He wanted some sport. He wanted some entertainment, right? He wanted, a, he wanted some excitement in his life. He wanted this this, you know, magician to do something. Look at verse 9. Herod's questioning, and Jesus gives no answer. Verse 10. An one up. Remember what they did in verse 5? These Jewish people? They got urgent. Look at verse 10. Vehement. It just went up a level, right? They're in trouble. Their position is looking worse and worse and worse. And so what they do is they just raise it up more and more. And they realize this isn't working for us. We've got to make it worse. And so what do they do? Herod brings contempt and mock. The soldiers bring physical abuse. They have bright clothes put upon Jesus. They sent him back. So what do we try to do? We show up with our own agenda. We show up with telling Jesus how he's supposed to act, how he's supposed to deal with this culture clash, how he's supposed to fix my problems, how he's supposed to handle my things instead of coming to him in dependence upon him and letting him call the shots. We treat Jesus with contempt. Look at this picture. This is what we look at. When he speaks to us about our culture, we just kind of raise our little lip. You know, that's kind of the way we look at Jesus. We, we, we treat him as with disrespect. We mock him. Jesus, I didn't get anything out of my quiet time. So I kind of wasted my time. No picture, no problem. And so, Jesus, I didn't really like that preacher. So you're wasting my time. We treat Jesus with contempt. Jesus didn't do what I asked him to do. What mattered to Jesus in these culture clashes are three important things. First of all, with the Jews, he wanted to make sure they knew he was the Son of Man, Son of God. Everyone knew that he was the Lord. With Pilate, he wanted to make sure that Pilate knew he was the king, right? Did Pilate think he was a king? No, but remember what happened when he put the sign on the cross? The king of the Jews in three languages, right? And the Jews said, what? Take the sign down and say, he said he was the king. No, Pilate says, no, leave it. He's the king of the Jews. And what was the deal with Herod? Jesus had a message for us. To through Herod. Who's really in control here? The one mocking? The one disrespecting? The one treating him with contempt? No answer is actually probably a louder answer than some answer. Think about that. Giving no answer to Herod was probably the most, the scream the loudest. Who's in control here? Who's in charge? So who's on trial in this passage? Yeah, it's us. Our hearts are on trial. Us in our promise, prom, um, prominence. Us in our peacekeeping. Us in our control. He did not regard his prominence and he elevated him 
And, and he is now elevated to ultimate authority. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. He received the violence in his own body so that he could bring about true shalom reconciliation between God and man. He laid down his rights, his life, so that he could take it up again. Pilate, Herod, the Jews didn't take it from him. He laid it down. He's in control. He's the one that can bring salvation. So how do you deal with your cultural clashes? Watch your prominence. Watch your codependence. Watch your control. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We're asking for you to continue to work and convict and change and transform our lives so that we would be sanctified. We'd be more like Jesus. We'd be dependent upon you. We'd be trusting in you. We'd be resting in you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would convict our hearts as we engage with these cultural clashes all around us. Deal with us. Help us to receive the truth first. Expose the darkness, we pray. Transform our lives. Send us out for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.